Good afternoon and welcome to ACCESS presentation of its new strategy plan for 2024 through 2026. A special welcome to those who are here in person who have braved the bad weather outside, thank you. Uh, and thank you also for those joining us on the webcast. Presenting today will be our Group CEO, Thomas Bubo, Group Deputy CEO, Frederic de Courtois, and our Group CFO, Alban de Maynel. For Q&A, they'll be joined by other members of our management team. So they won't necessarily stand up now, but uh, they'll, you'll see them later. So we have Patrick Cohen, who's CEO of Europe for AXA, Guillaume Bory, who's CEO of AXA France, Scott Gunter, who's CEO of AXA Excel, Hassan al Sharbashi, who's CEO of our international markets. Uh, we also have George Stansfield, who is Deputy CEO. Uh, as you know from last year, Hong Kong and um, Japan report to George. We also have Alexander Follett, who is our group COO. So with that, I turn to, oh, and AXA, I am AXA Investment Manager, is Marco Morelli. I'm so sorry, Marco. Uh, um, so with that, I turn over to uh, Thomas. Thank you, Anu, and good afternoon to all of you. Very happy to be with you uh, in this room. And uh, first, what I would like to do before we look forward and unlock the future, let's quickly look backward again what has happened uh, over the last uh, seven years. Because um, as you well know, because you have uh, accompanied the journey of transformation, what is called AXA today is very different to what uh, AXA was uh, seven years ago. What is AXA today? AXA is a company that is uh, much simpler, with a much more focused footprint, a company that is focused towards technical risk, coming very much um, from market risk and financial risk, and certainly focused on cash generation. What we see uh, over that period is that revenues have roughly been stable, plus 3%. However, underlying earnings have progressed by 34% and organic cash has progressed by 75%. So the business today is a high quality business that generates sustainable earnings, but in particular has a very high cash conversion. The business is a distinctive franchise and certainly very balanced. As a result of this transformation and the simplification, it's a business that relies 50% on commercial insurance, 50% on retail insurance, and within, we have focused ourselves on fewer positions, fewer geographies, but with leading positions. So if you look on the commercial insurance, which is 50%, we are today the largest global underwriter of corporate risks both for physical risks, buildings, uh, um, the production plants, but also for the human assets of companies. Or when we look uh, into the 50% retail insurance, we see that we are almost everywhere top three in Europe with a very strong agent distribution and a multi-line approach, but we are also strong in Japan, Hong Kong, and in 15 emerging markets where we are amongst the top five. As I said earlier, this business is very focused on high return on equity and high cash generation. But what is very distinctive and particular about it, that we are very close to our customers. Having predominantly agent distribution and having it very decentralized means being close to our customers. And that is also one of the reasons why our net promoter score has been increasing over the last year. So it's a very distinctive franchise if you look at what uh, else is around in the market. When we look back for the last time in to the existing plan that comes to the end, driving progress 2023, we can clearly say that it has happened in a challenging environment. Because I remember when we uh, launched this plan uh, three years ago, we were alone in the room. We had masks on because uh, it was in the middle of COVID. 
And since then, we have seen plenty of uh, crisis. And one can clearly say that uh, our model that I described earlier has been tested and validated because it has delivered a very strong and consistent performance in this very challenging environment. When we look at the four objectives we have set ourselves, we can clearly say that we have met one and exceeded three of them, which I think uh, is a very good result and wasn't so obvious at the beginning of this plan. When we look in particular what we have achieved in terms of shareholder return, we have returned roughly 13 billions in dividend and share buyback, which, if you go back to the market cap of at the beginning of this plan, represents roughly 30%. So this strong delivery is a consequence of the very deliberate strategic choice that we have made in order to shape the business as a business that is becoming for, has become far more reliable, far more consistent, but certainly a big generator of cash. Looking forward now, um, we come out of an uncertain environment and we believe that the macro environment going forward will remain very similar to what we have seen in the last plan. And this is why it's important to have a company that is well diversified and well balanced. And we've seen over the last plan that the group has proven to be solid in this difficult environment. And prudence and diversification were absolutely key for that. If you look at our asset allocation in terms of prudence, if you look at our very high solvency in terms of strength of the balance sheet, but also if you look at the limited sensitivity, for example, to interest rates, which is now roughly a third of what it used to be. And so we have also been very swiftly managing topics like inflation, topics like increase in, 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 uh, in interest rate through clear discipline around tarification, but also through discipline around the cost side. When we look at uh, this unstable environment, there is also a lot of upside because what we see is that in many areas, tectonic shifts are happening. So for example, when you look at retirement, at healthcare, we see that there is big opportunity for us where we can capitalize on what we have. Or if you think about uh, the big new phenomenon about generative AI, we are a business that is working a lot with unstructured data. Sin up to now, we have had no chance to really use this data in a more scaled fashion. With Gen AI, we are for the first time able to use both on the uh, risk assessment side, but also on the claim side, uh, this data. And then lastly, when you think about risks that become more difficult to ensure, for example, natural catastrophes or cyber, being able to offer prevention and risk consulting services will help us to keep these risks insurable. So the business has proven very resilient in a difficult environment and has shown that it can, despite this environment, deliver very predictable earnings. And I believe we are very well placed for this next phase, both in terms of continuing this uh, very consistent and stable return de delivery, but also capitalizing on these long trends, long-term trends that I just mentioned. This new plan is called Unlock the Future. Unlock the Future means that it is an evolution, not a revolution. We come probably out of a more revolutionary approach with a transformation over the last seven years. But as I mentioned earlier, we've got a platform now that works well. We want to continue the same strategy in scaling up what we have been doing well now. And this means that the focus in the next phase is very much on rigorous execution of the best practices. We want to address three different levers in this plan. Number one, driving higher organic growth. 
we believe that uh, there are some areas where we can expand more, some white spots, but we also believe that growing our distribution will enhance organic growth further. Secondly, we want to scale our technical capabilities. I mentioned earlier that the use of data and certainly the use of Gen AI and AI in general will help us to become more sophisticated and more technically um, focused when it comes to pricing, claims, and risk assessment. And then thirdly, we want to continue to enhance our operational excellence through shoring, automation, and data and AI, making sure that we are continuing our journey, which means that is a, an adapted strategy for an uncertain environment to scale up what we have proven to do well and not to go on a risky journey where we don't know what it means in this environment. All of this is happening on a base where our employees are extremely engaged. We have seen a significant improvement in our employee satisfaction, the employee net promoter score. To give you an idea, when we first measured it in 2017, we had a result that was minus five. The last result was plus 40, with which, which we are really um, in the area of the top companies. But we are not only continuing to focus on delivering excellent results, we are also continuing to focus to play a very important and engaged role in society. You know that we have been very leading around climate transition, helping industries to transition. We want to continue this and make sure that we stay leading, but shift more towards climate adaptation, helping companies to do more prevention, and also being more active on the underwriting side through more transition underwriting, i.e. focusing our underwriting capacity on those companies in more difficult sectors like uh, energy, transportation, and construction that have the heaviest charge of, trans of transition. Beyond climate, we would like to continue and scale up our engagement around inclusive insurance. We have been very strong in emerging markets and have managed to get to cover 14 million customers. We see, however, that in Europe, a similar issue is there. So for example, if you look into France, roughly 15 to 20% of people cannot afford insurance today because it's too expensive or are excluded. Rethinking insurance and making sure that we also offer something to these people is absolutely core for us. We want to start in France with a new range of products and then subsequently roll it out into Europe. When we look at this next financial plan, because we have a model that works well, because we have a model that is resilient in difficult times, we have decided to increase our financial targets, which reflects the confidence in the implementation of our model. The underlying earnings per share is moving from what used to be 3 to 7 percent to 6 to 8 percent, which is reflecting the stronger earnings base that we have. And the return on equity is moving from what used to be 13 to 15 to 14 to 16. Thirdly, the cash remittance is moving by from 14 billion to 21 billion, which is 50% higher than what it used to be in the last plan. If we manage to implement this three-year plan, it will certainly look very attractive for the shareholders, because with the new payout ratio of 75%, composed of 60% dividend and 15% share buybacks, it also means that we will be showing a very good return to our shareholders 
and that its EXA should remain and will become even more a very attractive investment. When we look at how are we delivering value, this very high return that we would like to give to shareholders will roughly equal 17 billion. 17 billion, based on yesterday's market cap, is roughly 25% of the market cap that will be returned to shareholders. And 25% of the earnings will be retained in order to fund organic growth, as we've seen earlier, at a very decent and good return on equity. So having built a very distinctive franchise, now focusing very much to, on the continuation of our track record in execution, while keeping very disciplined in the capital management and being disciplined around a very strong balance sheet, our strategy will deliver a sustainable and attractive value to our shareholders. With this, I will hand over to Frédéric de Courtois, who will now go into detail on how we are going to achieve it. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Good afternoon to you all. Thomas has told you about the what, what we want to achieve, the ambition. And I'll tell you about the how, the execution. Our plan is not a revolution because our starting point is very good. Our, our plan is an evolution based on a discipline and ambitious portfolio of initiatives. And I would like to discuss now about uh, these initiatives. First, let's look at our franchise. Our franchise is very good, and it is based on three principles. The first principle is that we are focused on geographies and businesses where we have scale, so usually top three, and technical edge. The second principle is that we are focused on capital light businesses. And the third principle is that we are a multi-specialist. So very technical on a wide range of businesses. Wide range of businesses because this is driven by distribution. And I have to say, we like it because this wide range of businesses drives cross-selling, but it also leads to lower capital requirements and lower volatility. These principles will not change over the next plan. If I look more specifically at our three business lines, our first business lines is uh, commercial line PNC, so from top clients to SMEs, to thir around 35 billion premiums. This is by definition a worldwide business. And we are probably, because there is no official ranking, we are probably the biggest player in the world on commercial lines. Our second business line is health and employee benefit. We are the number one in Europe on health. And we are probably the first player on employee benefit worldwide outside of the US. This is, again, a worldwide business by definition. And you see that we have around 20 billion premium on employee benefit and health. Our third business is retail. And this business is a local business. We have about 42 billion, so from PNC to uh, life and savings. And we are doing it in a limited number of countries, about 20 to 25 geographies. And again, countries where we are usually top three, sometimes top five. Yeah. 
So as mentioned by Thomas, we have three transversal initiatives over the next plan. The first one is organic growth. The second one is technical excellence. And the third one is operational excellence. And I will discuss later about the three initiatives for our three business lines. But before doing this, I would like to give you a high-level message on growth and a high-level message on technical excellence. On growth, you may have seen that our growth over the past three years, as growth of the top line, has been about 2% a year. And I'm sure you know that this growth has been negatively impacted by some uh, discipline decision that we've made over the past three years. So we've been extremely cautious on cash reinsurance. We've stopped the international health reinsurance business. We've been extremely disciplined on general account. So we've been extremely disciplined, which obviously impacted negatively the, 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 the growth. In addition to this, you need to, ta to take into account the fact that we've worked in 23 and we've, and we've launched and we've started to finance a portfolio of organic growth initiatives. And this por portfolio of organic growth initiatives will add an additional 1% per year to our growth over the coming years. So at the end, what we expect is a growth of about 5% per year of the top line over the coming three years. This is an indication. This is not a target. We don't have a top line target, but I think it gives you a high level, high level indication about our ambition. <coughs> My second comment on technical excellence. I'll start reminding you how we manage our business. We have a very important KPI at AXA, which we call the economic combined ratio. So the economic combined ratio takes into account our capital requirements, take into account our cost of equity, take into account the expected investment return, takes into account the normalized CAT, and at the end, you come out with the KPI, which says if you are under 100%, uh, you earn more than your cost of equity. By the way, we price our products with a cost of equity of 14%, which is cautious, but we are happy to have some buffers to, to face uh, change of assumptions, uh, change of context, and so on. And if I look at this KPI, our starting point is good, but we can improve. How can we improve on technical excellence? We've identified three main areas. The first one is about governance. You may have seen in June that we've created this uh, chief underwriting officer role. And our chief underwriting officer, so Nancy, is in charge of underwriting, pricing, and claims with the role of challenging and supporting our business units. And in addition to this, making sure that we scale up the good practices that we have around the world. The second area is that we have to turn around some businesses. If I look at my economic combined ratio, in 23, 89% of our business was making a higher return than our cost of equity which means that 11% was making less than of, of our cost of equity. So you can never be at 100% because you have ups and downs and so on. But our ambition is to be at more than 96% at the end of the plan. And what are the, th the, the areas where we really have to work to turn around the business? UK Health, UK Retail, Germany retail are the three main ones. So out of the 11%, the majority is, is made of these uh, three businesses. What I can tell you is that the turnaround of the three businesses is very well engaged and will be quick. The third area to improve technical excellence is 
a portfolio of concrete projects, and you can see them on the slide. I will comment on some of them, but I'd like to mention now only one, which is surely of interest to you, which is what we are doing on CAT. So first, if you look at our market share of worldwide CAT, it has decreased over the past four years from around 3.4% to 2.7%. So we've done the job. We've done the job, but as you may have seen in 2023, we are again above budget on, our, on, on CAT. It is clear that CATs are increasing and they are more difficult to model because there are a lot of secondary perils. So this is a fact, this is a threat, and this is also an opportunity. This is an opportunity if you can underwrite and price CAT in a very technical way. And we believe we have a technical edge on this. We have a technical edge because we've developed over the years our internal model on CAT, which we use in addition to the two market standards, which and it gives us a lot of insights. We have a CAT underwriting platform and we are, on, we are now rolling out a new, a new version which makes sure that everybody around the world is underwriting CAT in the right way and in a consistent way. And we are investing a lot on satellite imaging and geolocalization. So at the end, we believe that the CAT, the CAT business can be underwritten profitably. So summary of all of this. Our plan is about an accelerated growth of the top line. So we've said from about 2% to about 5%. And is about increased margins. If I look at the undiscounted combined ratio, we expect to improve the undiscounted combined ratio for the PNC business by two points over the plan. And we expect to improve the undiscounted combined ratio for life protection and health by about three points over the plan. I will look now at our first business line, which is, which is commercial lines. So commercial lines is a business in which we expect a growth at a rate more above GDP over the cycle. And this is only partially cycle dependent because you may have seen that half of our premiums, a bit more than half of our premiums, come from mean market, mean market and small business, which are less cycle dependent. The main growth initiative for us is mean market. Mean market is a business we are doing well in four countries in Europe, so France, Belgium, Germany, and Switzerland, and that we are almost not doing in other countries. We believe that this is for us a significant opportunity. This is a significant opportunity, and we are going to extend this business to countries we know, so to other countries in Europe, and in a selective manner in the US. Again, this is a business we know technically. This is a business we are going to do only in countries we know well. This is a business in which we are able to build uh, global programs. So we have a competitive edge for this business, and it will be a growth opportunity for us starting from the next plan. My second comment on technical excellence on commercial lines is about cycle management at Taxa XL. You know that over the past years, we were very much focused on the turnaround of AXA XL, and it has worked well. Now, we want to manage the cycle more than we did before. We want to manage the cycle on underwriting, and we want to manage the cycle on seeded insurance. So on underwriting, it means that we, we will underwrite the business when we like the prices. We will not underwrite the business when we don't like the prices. On seeded reinsurance, of course, 
our CDD insurance program is built based on our risk appetite and uh, volatility expectation, but it's also based on the return on equity of the cover. And depending on the price, we may be also opportunistic, and we started to, to be opportunistic at the end of uh, 23. So more cycle management at Axa XL and more cycle management for CDD insurance. By the way, you can see on the slide on the right, on, 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 on the, on the right part that the, the cycle for these various business lines is not the same, which is an opportunity, and which means that you have to underwrite in a granular basis. So for example, the, on some lines like property now, the cycle is very good. On some other lines like uh, cyber and DNO, the cycle is, is, is less good. And this is about portfolio management, and this is what we are going to implement in a more ambitious manner. Moving to our second business line, which is employee benefit and individual health, this is also a business line in which we expect a growth with, which is above GDP. So this is clearly a growth opportunity. Our main growth initiative on this is about employee benefit for SMEs. Usually big corporates are insured, SMEs are not, or the employees of the SMEs are not, and we believe that there is a significant opportunity for us. We have unique capabilities, we have scale, we have data, we have innovative services, and we especially have an internal tech company called EB Partners, which develops for all our employee benefit business around the world, tools and services underwriting tools, services for the HR departments of our clients, <coughs> services for the employees of our clients. So we believe that we have everything we need to develop this uh, SME business for employee benefit. On technical excellence for health and employee benefit, I'll start saying that we should recognize that we had three profitability accidents over the past three years. I think that's important to recognize it. First, we had COVID. Then we had the uh, health international reinsurance. And now in 23, we have the Health UK business. So three years in a row, we had an, an accident on the, on, the, on the health business. It should not hide that we have a very good, sound, and big business on health. But we've learned from this. And our main conclusion is that the best players are specialists. And this is why we've decided to create in June this uh, dedicated business units inside the EXA group to have a business unit dedicated to employee benefit and health, to have people thinking 100% of their time on health. And we believe that it is the secret for a successful health business. Concretely, what does it mean? It means that we will accelerate what we are, we, 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 we've already done, and what we've already done is having global pricing models. What we've already done is that we have global data sets, so we are pooling health data around the world to have better data to underwrite, but this is something we've already done that we are going to grow and to develop, and again, to think as a specialized company. The third and last business lines is retail. On retail, we expect a growth at uh, about the same pace of the GDP. We have a very good retail business, and we have a very good retail business driven by excellent proprietary distribution. Where will the growth come from? Basically, the growth will come from three areas. The first one is we've decided to grow our proprietary distribution channels. This is pretty new because we were very much focused over the past years on growing the productivity. And I'll come back to productivity. Now we've decided to grow also the size of our distribution channels in France, in Europe, in Japan. And we've concluded that this is probably the best investments we can, we can make. 
we have very good distribution channels, so adding resources to, to these distribution channels is a very good investment. The second area is about productivity. We are again going to grow productivity over the next plan. The plan that we have is to grow the productivity by 10% over the next three years, and we will be very much helped by AI. The last cycle was very much helped by the fact that we learned to sell without meeting physically the client. Now AI will help us a lot and help, it, help, it, help us a lot on managing leads and so on and so on. The third growth opportunity for us is the life business. Life business is important for us. Life business is about protection and savings. And we believe that we have extremely good opportunity as, for instance, we are going to relaunch our savings business in Belgium that we had, that we had stopped some years ago. We are going to relaunch our individual health business in Switzerland. We believe that we have significant opportunity in Asia. We believe we have significant opportunity in Germany. We are determined to accelerate our CSM growth above 3% a year while remaining disciplined. On technical excellence, a word on uh, PNC retail. First, it's a, lot, it's a lot about data, tech everywhere. So this is a lot about industrialization. And I do not resist the temptation to make a teaser on what we call our computable contract initiative. I'm not sure you've heard about this. We worked over the past six years with some universities to build computable contracts. You know that insurance is about contracts at the end. It's about contracts and they are all different. Computable contract is a contract that can be read by a computer to make it simple. It has huge benefits for the clients because the contract is, is much more clear and it has huge benefit for the company on the productivity, on the leakage, and so on. We started over the past two years to implement co computable contract for retail business. It's a 10 years work. And we are going to do it also for commercial lines. The last initiative I would like to mention is operational excellence, which is a, a, transverse, a transversal initiative for our three business lines. The first objective of this initiative is to decrease our non-commission expense ratio by 0 po 0 0.5 points to 9.3 percent. So quite, a quite significant uh, decrease of, of this uh, expense ratio. And for this reason, we are going to be extremely focused on efficiency and productivity over the next plan. We have four ongoing initiatives. The first one is continue and complete the basics. What are the basics? The basics is about our common infrastructure, and we have already a common infrastructure, and we are going to complete our move to the cloud by 2026, so huge work. The second one is that we are progressively moving to a common architecture for all our systems. The third one, uh, again, on the basics, is that we are moving to a common data taxonomy for all our systems. And the last I would like to mention is that we have, we have moved over the past years and we continue to do it to common systems for support and control functions. But we've decided to keep local systems for insurance applications. So this is, this is the first initiative. This is about building the basics. The second initiative is to automate all simple tasks. So this is about industrialization of what we've been doing over the past years. The experience that we have is that for operations, which represent 40% of our headcount, we're able to improve productivity by 3% a year. 
So automate all simple tasks. The third initiative that we have is to offshore more. We have about 10% of our headcount in offshoring, so about 11,000 people in three offshoring centers, so in India, in Morocco, and in Poland. We will grow it to 12% by the end of the plan. And why do we do it? We do it, we still do it obviously for cost reasons, less than before, but we still do it for cost reasons. But we also do it because we don't find anymore the right competencies in our mature markets. Especially we, don't, especially we don't find enough engineers. So for us, this is an opportunity also to find the right people. So we don't offshore anymore low added value tasks. We offshore high value, added value tasks. The last initiative that we have is to scale up our data and AI projects. It's easy to build pilots. It's easy to build use cases. It's difficult to make scale up and to do it everywhere. Together with Alex, we are extremely focused on this. We have 400 use cases around the world, but we have identified 17 that we will implement everywhere. Conclusion. I've said that our plan is about execution, but what makes us confident that we are going to be able to execute well? First, I think we have a good internal governance. A good governance is a governance in which people work together, but you know exactly who is deciding what. Second, and I, I am obviously totally biased on this, I believe we have a good management team. What I can tell you is that we have a very good team spirit. And as mentioned by Thomas, we have also a high morale because our employee net promoter score is at the highest score ever and can be probably improved again. Last but not least, we have strong capabilities and a good track record because we've achieved all targets of the last plan. So this is where we are. We have a good plan. And what is new about this plan is that we really want to share more and to scale up. How do we do it? We do it because we've built centers of excellence. So our centers of excellence, to give you some examples, we have one on AI, we have one on cyber insurance, we have one on EB, and we also have communities and expert networks to make sure that what we do is really scaled up. So we have a clear plan, we have the right team, it's all about execution, Count on us. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, so we have a clear plan. So now what are the numbers behind, the, behind this plan? So if I, if I look at uh, the big picture, in terms of uh, earnings growth, we plan to increase our underlying earnings per share by uh, six to eight percent every year and on average, but every year. You know that um, we increase our earnings, but we have a strong focus on cash and capital generation, and we, we have had that for a number of years, which allows us to transform those earnings into cash for XISA, and so we plan to have 21 billion euros of remittance for XISA over the next three years. That compares to the target that we had for the last three years, which was 14 billion, and we, as you know, uh, surpassed that because we had 16 billion. But nevertheless, it is a significant increase compared to um, the previous plan. We have also increased our target return in the sense that we had 13 to 15%. We are moving to 14 to 16%. Why? Simply because we are increasing margins, but we are increasingly a capital light company, which allows us to have that high level of RE. And when you combine all this, that allows us 
to have a best-in-class payout ratio at 75% with a strong commitment on it, and I will come back to that later, and notably on uh, the dividend. And all this is done while maintaining a very strong balance sheet and not at the expense of our financial robustness. And so you will see that obviously those uh, targets are ambitious, but they are realistic. And let me explain why we believe they are realistic. Let's start with the underlying earnings per share growth. So as I said, 6 to 8 percent, made of 2 percent coming from the benefits of share buybacks, and 4 to 6, let's say 5 to simplify, coming simply from underlying earnings growth. But when we build this plan bottom up, we took into account a number of headwinds that you all know, and which for some of them are significant. And so um, it's very clear for us that, for instance, the unwind of the discount benefit will be a drag. It's very clear for us, and as uh, Frédéric said, that we will increase a bit our NADCAT load to take into account secondary perils. It's clear also that um, prices at AXA XL have probably reached their peak or are close to that. And also that interest rates will probably be slightly declining with the impact that uh, you know notably on the discount on PNC. And last, we also have the uh, OECD tax reform that kicks in this year and that we also have taken into account. So all this is in our plan and when we say that we can grow underlying earnings by 5%, that's after having taken that uh, into account. Now let's look into the details of uh, our underlying growth. PNC, we plan to grow our underlying earnings by 4 to 6%. The global picture is we will grow our revenues at 5%, and uh, that's in line with what Frédéric said when he said that we wanted to grow like nominal GDP, but I'll come back to that. We reduce our combined ratio by two points over the period. We will have, as I said, that drag from the unwind, but it will be somewhat compensated, but not entirely by additional investment income. And finally, we will have, uh, we know that you may have seen in, the, in our presentation and in 23, we had positive tax one-offs that we will most probably not have in the plan, but conversely, we will have the OECD tax. And so compared to 23, that's 200 million less earnings. Now, if you look at the detail by line of business, the dynamic will not be the same between commercial lines on one hand and retail lines on the other hand. Commercial lines, we plan to grow slightly above nominal GDP simply because we have a number of initiatives that Frédéric has just described on mid-market, on new risks that will, I will not go through, but nevertheless are significant to boost our growth. Margins on commercial lines, we believe that at XAXL, as I said, prices will probably increase a little bit, but in line with loss trend. And therefore, we don't expect margin expansion at XIXL over the plan. Conversely, for the, what we call the GIs, the, XI, the other X entities that focus on the SME and mid-market, we still view, uh, see some potential for margin expansion there, both because of price increases and also improved underwriting. On the retail side, uh, the, um, the growth will be slightly lower because we want to focus on profitability there. And you may have seen that in 23, we had a deviation in our attritional loss ratio on the retail side. That we need, we want to amend, and we want to amend extremely quickly. So on, on this, and when I look at our margins uh, over the plan, so the two points combined ratio, more than half 
of that two-point improvement will come in 24, notably because of the recovery that we will have on the retail side. As I said, we have increased our um, CAT budget to 4.5 points to take into account the secondary perils. Our reserving policy has not changed. So we will carry on having uh, positive PYDs. And you know that we want to use those PYDs to offset, if need be, volatility coming from NatCat and discount going forward. And as Frédéric said, we will um, improve through productivity our expense ratio by 0 0.5 points, and that will reflect into our PNC combined ratio. If I now move to life and health, you have, as you know, different components in our PNL on uh, life and health. You have the CSM for all participating businesses. CSM, we plan to grow it at a rate above 3%, given the quality of the business that we have. And the CSM release will grow proportionally, i.e. as well above 3%. But um, what you need to have in mind as well is that on the life and health side, we have 15 billion of premiums that are PNC-like, where the combined ratio, and therefore less inertia than the CSM itself. That's the EB and individual health business. And uh, as uh, was said earlier, we plan to grow that business, and we have a good number of initiatives, at a high rate of 6%. So that's the 15 billion that we want to grow at 6%. But we also want to uh, reduce the combined ratio of that business by three points over the next three years. And within those three points, you have the recovery of the UK health business. So there again, very significant portion of those three points, again, more than half, will come in 2024. As to investment income and unwind, we uh, plan to have a uh, balance, so it will be reasonably stable over the plan, the higher investment income offsetting the uh, higher unwind. And overall, like for PNC, we plan to have earnings growth between 4 and 6% in life and health. But again, what I want to emphasize is the fact that that short-term business that represents today one-third of our profits will represent two-thirds of the profit growth over the plan, give or take. Moving to um, asset management. So asset management, we um, have a very strong platform, both on the, what we call the core part, i.e. the liquid assets, on the alts part, the other alternative assets. You probably have seen that in 2023, we had uh, very good net new money from third parties with a good balance between the two platforms. We plan to have that over the next three years, repetition of that, plus con cost containment, and therefore we plan to grow our earnings by 7% every year at AXIM. On the holding side, you will see a slight deterioration for a couple of reasons. One, simply, it's the uh, it's AXI say that um, borrows the money, and therefore with the higher interest rates, cost of debt will be slightly higher. First point. Second point, even if the bulk of the investment in technology is done at local entities level, you still need, you will see some, you will still see some at uh, AXI-SA level. And last, you will have part of the uh, impact of the OECD tax at AXI-SA level. To be clear, um, Bermuda 
has implemented a new tax kicking in next year, and that impact you will see at XIXL. But when it comes to the other countries that are impacted by o the OECD tax, i.e. for us, Ireland and Hong Kong, the cost will be borne by XIXL because the tax is due to the French government. So those are for our earnings. Now moving to capital generation. I want to insist on the transformation we have gone through over the last years in terms of capital requirement. We have significantly re reduced our capital requirement and moved to a capital light business. We've done that through the change in business mix, moving from typical general account, heavy on capital business, to more capital light business and moving to PNC. In the design of our products and notably on the uh, saving side, we have reduced the amount of guarantees and you know that we are working on products that have only a guarantee at maturity, which is also in the interest of our customers, but in our interest as well, because it reduces the capital required. We have reduced our duration gap to zero. And that has significantly decreased our uh, sensitivity to interest rate. And finally, we have uh, implemented that uh, group internal reinsurance, as you know, which means that the um, earnings that we create, create more solvency in terms of point. So we told you last year that we would generate 25 to 30 points of, of solvency every year. In 23, we produced 29 points. But that guidance is still true for the next plan, 25 to 30. I just want to make it clear that it's after the funding of growth. It's net of the, that growth, which we believe will cost us four points of solvency every year. But nevertheless, we will grow um, capital, we will have capital generation of 25 to 30 points every year. Having those earnings, having that capital generation, and having worked a lot on the remittance uh, from the entities to AXA-SA, that means that AXA-SA will receive a lot more cash in this plan than in the previous one. We target an 80% remittance ratio. We were at 79% in 23, so 80% is normal for us now, which means that AXA-SA will receive over the three years more than 21 billion of cash from its subsidiaries. How will it use its cash? 3.5 billion will be, over the three years, the cost of AXA-SA, interest on its debt and general expenses. We don't plan to keep a lot, if anything, more at AXA-SA level in terms of cash, which means that everything else will be paid out to our shareholders in the form of a dividend and share buyback. So 17 billion to our, uh, to our shareholders. And as uh, Thomas said, that represents roughly 25% of our uh, market cap today. A word on our um, ROE. I mentioned that at the beginning. So we, we have increased it to 14 to 16% as a target for the reasons I, I mentioned, notably on the fact that we are capital light. You see the ROE per business is good in all our lines. 14% in life and health, 16% in PNC, and 25% in asset management. Which means that the 25% that we will not redistribute to our shareholders, but that we will keep for our growth, will be reinvested at a, in a business that has very good ROE, and that will also drive the growth of our book value. As I said, um, all this is not done at the expense of our balance sheet. We are operating now at a level which is 227%. 
we intend to operate at a level which will be at that level, give or take. And why that? Simply because even after the, uh, the dividend and the share buyback, we will have a bit more solvency every year thanks to, I, to our significant capital generation. And very importantly, because the sensitivities of our solvency ratio to financial markets, and notably to interest rates, have considerably reduced over the last two years. So we have a robust balance sheet, we have a significant solvency ratio, and we don't plan to depart from that. Cash, it was four billion at the end of 23. As I said, we don't plan to retain a significant amount of cash at XIC level coming from the entities, so you can plan on a stable level of cash at XIC. And last, on our debt, um, we maintain our 19 to 23% gearing ratio guidance, but nevertheless, we don't plan, everything else being equal, to issue debt on a net basis. Obviously, you know that we need to uh, tackle the um, end of the grandfathering, but apart from that, on a net basis, we will uh, not issue new debt. So that brings me to um, the capital management policy. So what is it exactly? A 75% payout ratio made of 60% from dividend, 15% from annual share buyback. So 75% of our underlying earnings per share will be distributed every year. The dividend per share will be at least equal to the prior year's dividend. So we introduce a floor to our capital management policy. And we are also extremely clear on the fact that you will have dividend and share buybacks first, and then, and then only M&A. So M&A will not be done at the expense of buybacks. And last, we... Um, keep what we had for the last plan, which is the fact that whenever we would sell a business or we would do an enforced transaction, we would neutralize the impact on earnings through a buyback in order to maintain our earnings per share. So that's our capital management policy. Thank you. Uh, in summary, Four things to remember. Number one, we have built a, a very distinctive franchise that is balanced and that has worked well in an uncertain environment. Second point, we have a platform now that is able to consistently deliver with very predictable earnings. Third one, our plan is to do more of the same. So scale up what has been done well in one place, to do it everywhere. We believe this is the best strategy in an environment that remains uncertain. Focus is really on discipline execution. Fourthly, the new plan that is built bottom-up will come with higher financial targets and, as you've seen, with a more attractive capital management policy. Thank you, and we're now moving to your questions and our answers. And since I'm still in debt, uh, to Andy Sinclair from last time when I couldn't uh, uh, let him ask a question because we ran out of time. He's got the privilege to ask the first question today. Thank you very much. Uh, a, a man who clearly keeps his promises. Um, thank you very much, Thomas. Um, three for me. It's Andy Sinclair from Bank of America. Um, and uh, I, I would like to say um, as well, well done for the targets and, and for making those commitments to shareholders. That's, that's a big deal and it, it is appreciated. Uh, for, first is on holding company cash. Um, I, I like the remittance targets and, and commentary you've given. I just really want to dig into a little bit in terms of what's in there, and both in 2023 and, and going forwards. Um, holding sure, cash. Sorry. Holding company cash. So I just want to dig into what's in there for, for both 2023 and, and going forward. Um, when I look at the 2023 numbers, I know there was meant to be some cash coming through from the holding company becoming a reinsurance mixer. I think there was 
talked about maybe one billion coming up in 2023 and, and another billion in 2025. I, I didn't see that much coming through in 2023. and I'm just keen to understand how much of the future cash is included in the, the, the 21 billion target. Uh, likewise, the, the French transaction, I think, was guided for 600 million. Um, I think only a bit less than that came through. And, and likewise, we've clearly got the German transaction that's still out there. What's included in the cash numbers in 2023? What's in the 21 billion is, is my first very lengthy question. The others are shorter, don't worry. Um, the second question was just uh, an update on, on what scope is there still for back book management? Uh, what more is there to be done uh, over the plan? And, and maybe as part of that, an update on the German disposal. Uh, and the third question was just on the reinsurance renewals. Uh, looks like you've kept your retentions flat while adding more capacity. Good to see, nice and conservative. Uh, but when I look at the, the, the slide about the one in 20 risk um, deviation, it looks like the one in 20 deviation's actually gone up. And, and I think that's deviations even from a, a higher NatCat budget. Just keen to, to understand that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andy, for your three questions. Um, Alban, uh, I, so, I uh, propose that you ask the first question, which was, in fact, two questions. One is, um, what is in the 21 billion and what is in the 4 billion hold core cash in 23 and going forward? And are the um, transactions, uh, Citadel, the reinsurance, um, French transaction and potentially German transaction in there? Um, second topic um, was around uh, the scope uh, for backbook an update on Germany, I would take that. And then thirdly, Scott, if you could uh, take um, the question around reinsurance renewal uh, and the um, question around the 1 in 20 risk deviation and relation to NetCat. Alban, first question. Yes, so um, you probably remember, Andrew, that um, there were two different benefits uh, in uh, transforming XIS into reinsurer. There was the, the fact that we merged it into with AXA Global Re, and uh, by having that, we had 700 million cash from AXA Global Re coming into um, AXA SA. So that's in the line other that you have in the table, and you have 400 million in 22, 300 million in 23, or, or the, the reverse, but that's not in the remittance as such. But the, the other benefit which is simply to have cash at XISA, that is included in the 6.3 remittance, and therefore that all is also included going forward in the 21 billion uh, remittance from uh, that, that I showed a minute ago. The recurring benefit. Yeah, the recurring benefit. Th does that answer your, your question? Uh, I think for the and for the yes, sorry. So uh, on the, um, so first on the French disposal, you should uh, bear in mind that the net cash benefit will be minimal given that we have um, a, uh, we will launch a share buyback uh, up to 500 million quickly to offset the dilution coming from this, this transaction. So don't expect a net benefit on this or a minimal one. And on the German transaction, we have not uh, closed it yet. And so there is no um, benefit of that in our past numbers, nor in the 21 billion. Second question, Andy, which is half answered. So uh, any more scope uh, for backbook? I mean, we have to go back again to see uh, what we have done in terms of uh, backbook transactions. And probably we've been the most um, active actor in the industry around uh, backbook since um, we came uh, at the time from 80% uh, being in life insurance. Today, uh, the job, I would say, is considered to be mostly done. Uh, there might be uh, a few portfolios uh, here and there that we would still look at, but uh, is it something that we would focus on 24 hours a day? The answer is clearly no. And uh, as Alban said, uh, on the German backbook transaction still ongoing, uh, we are expecting uh, this to uh, drag into, I would say, to the end of March uh, to have a concrete result. Scott, on the range shots. Yeah, just on the, on the one in 20, Andy, a couple of things. One, you know, uh, Frederick mentioned it, we're leaning into the model. We've updated the model, so you get a little bit of an update to the models, uh, particularly on that one in 20, which is the 
almost the attritional cat, if you want to call it that, which is that active working cat. And we've seen that certainly in 23, where there was 100 billion in cat losses, all of it in that sort of working cat area. Second one is we're, we're leaning a little bit more into more recent years in the models, right? So there's been more cat activity in more recent years versus the past. So you see a little bit uptick, particularly again in that one in 20 working layer. And then the third component is we've had, you know, with market conditions uh, and pricing, we grew our property portfolio as a percentage of our overall portfolio. We grew property uh, more in 23, right? Because the, the pricing increases continued there. So we had a little more property writings. So all three of them contribute to that one in 20. Michael? Um, thank you very much. Um, one is very, they're, they're very lightweight questions, I'm afraid. The, the first one is, um, what are you going to do? I mean, I know what the, all these guys are going to do, but what are you going to do? Because <laughs> it, it sounds like the no deals, Everything's the machines running smoothly. You know, it's a, like it's a, it, it, it's a simple it's answer. A, a Put <laughs> these guys on fire. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, that, that's fair. But the, I suppose the real question is why? Why did you want? If insurance is such a great sector at the moment, why did you want to buy more of it um, in in whatever form? And it, I mean, if you if you look at the numbers, that maybe there's two billion left for M&A. It's, it sounds tiny. Um, and then the uh, the other question is much more. Um, <laughs> kind of numbers question. So you said UK motor, like, or UK retail and UK health. Um, I'm assuming that's the uh, half of the improvement in combined ratio. Um, can you get, actually give us some numbers just for 24? That'd be so helpful. And, and um, I'm afraid that's, that's uh, oh yeah. And the last question, the 17 billion, I, I, I can't reconcile and it's, it's, it's a silly question, but if I add the 7.6 billion, the eight and the 8.4, so growing the 7.6 at 5% a year, that's 24 billion, 75% of 24 billion, and maybe my maths is wrong, is 18, it's not 17, but hey, it's a small number. This was obviously the test for today, no. So, the first question I guess I have to answer. The second one uh, on uh, UK health and retail, Patrick, if you could answer that. Um, and the last one uh, on the 17 billion and uh, reconciling this album, if you could do that. So, uh, on the first question, I mean, obviously, uh, we are coming from uh, a period in which uh, we have done a lot of deals. Um, this was absolutely necessary to build uh, what AXA is today. Today, as I said earlier, we have a franchise that is balanced, that is uh, well diversified. So uh, we don't need to rely uh, on doing more M&A uh, to make it better. As I said, the spirit of this plan is really to scale up. So because we have been focusing a lot in the last phase on deals, uh, we probably uh, did not focus uh, enough on the organic improvement and on the organic scaling. And so if you ask what I'm going to do, um, I'm not going to work on deals anymore, but I'll be working on helping my colleagues uh, to um, really work on the scaling up. So what has worked well in one place? How can we make sure we scale it up? Um, because we have a good platform and we have enough power ourselves and you've seen we're investing over two billion uh, in really making it work. So that will be my new day job going forward. Patrick on uh, UK Retail, UK Health. Yeah, so UK Retail, uh, UK Health, thanks for the, for the question and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Well, turnarounding this portfolio is number one priority for Europe. Uh, I'm gonna walk you into some of the actions we're taking. It's very bold actions, comprehensive programs uh, no, no stone unturned from pricing and writing claims. We also changed uh, the, some members in the team. The, the person uh, uh, now leading UK retail is the ex-CFO of AXA Switzerland, and uh, we're bringing someone uh, from uh, the competition on, uh, on, on health. Um, so let's start one by one. So if we start with the, the UK retail, well, you know, it's a, it's a tough market. It has been a tough market last year. Uh, fundamentally, we had planned for inflation. And if you remember, across Europe, uh, we had an increase of price of 11% and in the UK of 44%. And that played well. We got hit by two things that I think hit the market. One is a very high level of a not gap, and the second one is a bump in frequency around, uh, around 8, 8%. Fundamentally, uh, blurring patterns post-COVID that hit, uh, I repeated, all, uh, all the market. 
Um, so what are we doing very concretely? So after the, the very strong price increase in, uh, in 23, we are putting double digit price increase in place uh, uh, already. Uh, we are re-underwriting part of the portfolio. So we're looking broker uh, account by broker account um, uh, and, and pulling out in some of the less profitable areas of the portfolio. So we're pulling out of bytes, out of telematics, out of some geographies where uh, fundamentally we get data on higher uh, theft. And so we are very, very granular in, into that. I must say, you know, I. I have a weekly meeting with the, with the team on this and we'll have right one after that <laughs> uh, 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 today. So we're, we're putting part of the portfolio. Something that is very important as well is what we're doing on claims. I believe that across Europe, by the way, we can do far better on claims in the context uh, we, 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 we have seen there's upside there. Uh, all the IT and technology budget of the UK is fundamentally today uh, put uh, uh, at work for the technical excellent part of the business. So we shuffle completely in the investment in that direction. And on claims where we're obsessed with the uh, orientation, I'm seeing it picking up uh, in the last months. Uh, we're also seeing uh, thanks to AI and predictive recovery tool, uh, recoveries going up. Fraud is also uh, picking. So all those metrics are going in the right direction and will continue uh, to invest in that place. Uh, last but not least, so I talked about what we're doing on the portfolio, on the pricing, on claims. I want to talk about the expense management. Uh, we uh, have uh, far tighter expense management objectives for this year. Uh, and we want to simplify, uh, globally speaking, uh, 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 our, our organization uh, setup uh, as a whole uh, in the UK to try to, to, to bring this business in retail back to profitability, to your question in 24, that is the objective. Now, if I'm, if I'm moving to the UK health, um, well, you know also there that this is a market phenomenon. Fundamentally, uh, the NHS performance deteriorated post COVID, you know the stats, uh, I think it's more than 7 million people are, that are waiting list in the UK, so it's a quite, uh, quite bold and profound phenomenon. Uh, um, I should say uh, right from the start that our UK health business is a very healthy one. Uh, we got 30% market share on a 2 billion business, uh, and it had typically a combined around 96%. So, you know, a very strong position. That's the base we're starting from, and we're addressing very intensively what, uh, what is at stake here with the NHS uh, deterioration. So, there again, uh, very, very unprecedented, I would say, prices increases across all segments. Individual, SME, and large corporates. To give you an idea, we're repricing all of our corporate and SME book to be profitable, all of it, this year. Um, we, we have done, obviously, some, uh, some, uh, some pruning. And what we have done as well is investing in our ability to reprice far more frequently. So if we could do that you know, from a quarterly basis, now we're going to be able to do this month by month. Last but not least, and very importantly, because that's the, I think, part of the name of the game uh, in health, uh, we are absolutely obsessed with steering there. So we increased steering in the last six months by 30%. So all our teams are absolutely focused on this. We're reviewing steering as well as part of our terms and conditions. We want to have more guided products. We're working on network management and also uh, on, on, on AI by scaling some of the, the fraud tools we have. Uh, last but not least, on the claims front, we're also working on password management. I think that's quite innovative. We have now medical protocols that enable us to do two things. On one end, uh, better medical uh, outcomes for our customers, but also obviously cost containment uh, 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 for us. So, when it comes to the, 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 the numbers and what we are aspiring to do, as I said, we were around a, a historically a combined 96, we'll get closer to that. So the bulk of the turnaround will happen this year. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, Alban, 17 billion, reconciliation. If I con can complement Patrick's answer and uh, committing on his behalf, that should represent 350 million before tax overall between the health and, and motor. You can. Uh, the 17 billion, I think, I mean, 
the difference with your calculation might well be that in 24, 25, 26, we pay 35% of 23, 24, 25 earnings. So we have a one year lag and I think that's the, uh, that's the difference. Farouk. Hi, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Farouk Ali from JP Morgan. Um, just wanna go back a little bit cheekily to the M&A question uh, or, or just actually, what, why do you need 227% solvency ratio? Because um, you know, clearly your sensitivities have gone down. You know, I, I don't think m and is a dirty word anymore given what you've achieved. Um, or you could reduce debt. So I'm just kind of understanding why you need that surplus. Uh, and if you were to do m and I mean, you did layer. Uh, I mean, would health, would employee benefits be the obvious kind of bolt-on area to look at? Um, Second question is on XRE. Um, it seems every time you know I speak with management, there's kind of yeah, we'll go with it. Maybe we maybe we don't need a kind of attitude. So, what's your position right now on the in the business and, and how much capital's in it? If you did run it off, for example. Um, and, and then the third question is on your macro assumptions. Um, so, you know, it's really good that you've embedded this into your numbers. I don't think every insurer does that. Um, in their guidance, so can you explain, particularly around interest rates, what you're assuming? Is it the forward curve? I mean, can you give us some sort of guidance on where we should expect the sort of three, five year, or 10 year to, to swap rate to fall in within that? Thank you. Thank you, Farouk. So I'll do the first question. Uh, Frederick, if you can do the second one on uh, uh, XLV, um, what is happening, how much capital is in there? And then, uh, Alban, if you could uh, do uh, the third question around uh, the macro numbers. Uh, on the first question, <laughs> it's interesting to have that question now because for the last seven years we always had the reverse question. Um, however, I will not change my answer. First of all, um, the uh, balance sheet strength of 227%, uh, I think, is a great achievement. And not only so much um, the absolute level of solvency, but certainly the uh, sensitivities around the solvency. As Albon mentioned, um, the interest rate sensitivity is a third of what it used to be. And so we feel very comfortable with that uh, solvency and therefore we also have not uh, given a new target around solvency. And you've seen that uh, we will automatically create uh, more solvency as we go along. Um, you're absolutely right. Uh, we did uh, some M&A uh, deals recently, but smaller ones. Uh, if you look into Turkey, if you look into Spain, if you look into Leia in, in Ireland. And so uh, we are saying that our hierarchy is very clear. Dividend first, Shabba back second. And then uh, when there is money left and there is a sensible M&A deal in the uh, spirit of a liar or um, uh, what we have done uh, on Credit Mutuel in Spain, we will certainly look at it. But the focus is very much on organic development of our platform. And therefore, you see there is no target uh, of earnings increase from M&A in our plan. Frédéric, on the reinsurance. On, X on XXL Re. So our priority number one was to make money with this company, which we had not done over the first five years. And we had last year a result of uh, 487 million euro at Axa XLE on a capital of about 3.5 billion. So we are happy with what has been done. By the way, Nancy was the CEO of the, of the, of the reinsurance. The cycle remains good. The renewals on the 1st of January have went well. So we believe that 24 will again be a good year. Then now we are a company of a bit less than a 3 billion premium, making money. That's where we are. Thank you, Frédéric. And then uh, let's go to Alban on the macroeconomic. So on the interest rates, um, our view is that, I mean, like the market, we believe that central banks will reduce interest rates very progressively. And when there is strong evidence that inflation is under control, we believe that, I mean, the pivotal um, year is the five year rate for, for us, given the, the discount. And we believe that it will stabilize probably where it was at the end of 23 which is a bit lower than what it is uh, today. And we will have the normal slope 
between the, uh, the short-term rates and the five-year and then the 10-year. But that is probably in 25, I'm talking about the, uh, the short-term rates, when uh, central banks have reduced their, their, their um, policy rates. Thank you, Alban. Let's go uh, to Peter. Thank you very much. Uh, Peter Elliott from Capital Chevrolet. Um, the first one uh, on the two points of combined ratio benefit, I mean, a great uh, ambitious target, and that sounds great, and clearly a big driver of the EPS improvement. Um, I'm just thinking, I mean, some of those parts are very much within your control on the expense side of things. Some of them probably, Nat Cap, for example, um, less so. You mentioned over sort of one point coming from retail, but I guess things could change between now and 2026. So I'm just wondering if you can sort of give us some, some comfort on, um, you know, where you see the main sort of risks to achieving that overall, and yeah, therefore sort of how, how, confident, how confident we, c we can be in that number, be the first one. Um, the, the second one was uh, on the discount benefit that you had, I think H2 was 3.2% after 4.2% in H1. Um, and I'm just wondering if you can just elaborate what, why there was such a big drop, if my maths is, is right, whether there was more seasonality than, than we thought. Um, relate to that, that the duration has sort of stayed down at the half year level of 3.7, so quite a big drop from last year. And I'm just, yeah, just interested in understanding those, those moving parts. It'd be great. Um, and then maybe a, a third one um, on the dividend. You know, I guess the message in the past has always been we should expect it to grow in line with earnings. Now it seems to be we've taken a bit of a, a jump and it's a, a more clear link to a payout ratio. Should I think about that you know, in line with the new strategy, you know, very much focused on organic growth, therefore a payout ratio is, is more appropriate now, especially everything you've said on, on M&A. Um, is that the right way of thinking about it going forward? Good. Thank you, Peter. So uh, on the first one, Frederick, if you could um, talk a little bit about where are the main risks um, in achieving the 2% uh, combined ratio improvement. Alban, the discount benefit and the uh, change in it is for you, and I'll take the third one on the dividend. Frederick. So first on the, on, the, on the two points. If I look at commercial lines and retail, most of the improvement will come from retail. And if I look at uh, how will it happen, basically from the two points you have 0 0.5 points of the common ratio, which is the expense ratio. So I would say high level of confidence. And then out of what remains, the one and a half, you more or less half is the turnaround of the business in, in retail UK and uh, retail Germany. And half are improvements coming from all our initiatives. So the deg degree of certainty is really high on the expenses, is really high on the turnaround in uh, Germany and the UK. Then the third part, uh, we have to work hard, uh, implement the tools on the tech tools, the data, uh, the data projects that we have and so on. So you could argue that there's a bit less certainty. Then on, on the discount on uh, H1 versus H2, I, I leave aside the interest rate part because that you know as well as I do. Um, so there, is, there are two things. W a minor one, which is the fact that there is always a bit more discount in H1 than in H2 because you discount the claims that you will eventually pay in H2. But the, the more fundamental part is um, every year we will review uh, with great scrutiny our payment pattern. And uh, looking at it in H2 uh, has led us to uh, see that the duration is shorter. I think we had 4.2 years and we now have 3.7 years. And that's because we, looking at all our reserves, the payment pattern, it has shortened compared to what we had a year ago. On your third question, Peter, I mean, look, uh, the reason why the board has decided to propose um, a higher payout ratio on the dividend was clearly uh, linked to the model change that we had. I mean, uh, if you uh, go back, uh, having a model that is highly uh, reliant on financial risk means that you have a lot of volatility. 
We have worked hard uh, over uh, the last seven years to bring volatility down. And certainly what I mentioned earlier around the interest rate sensitivity being a third of what it used to be, uh, I think is a good illustration of it. And that's why we feel comfortable with the consistency of the model and the consistency in the delivery uh, to go higher. Secondly, we wanted to establish a very clear hierarchy uh, around dividend first, share buyback second, and then if there's anything left uh, and if there's any interesting opportunity, uh, smaller M&A. So that it's very clear around the question, um, are you still going to go on big M&A? That the answer is definitely no. And that is also like, uh, you know, screwed in uh, that this answer will be no and that there is a clear commitment to the market. And then thirdly, your question around, um, will the dividend uh, grow in line with earnings? Yes, the absolute dividend will continue to grow in line with earnings. Andrew? Um, afternoon, it's uh, Andrew Crean, your journalist. Um, this time last year, you told us that personal lines uh, would be flat margin. The claims ratio is up two and a half points. Um, why should we have confidence that you can uh, improve it and it can be such a substantial part of the two points this year? Because I think you're saying it's coming, a lot of it's coming this year. Secondly, on Excel insurance, uh, given the softness in financial lines, which is a big part of your business, do you expect uh, to make more money out of Excel insurance in 24 than 23? And then thirdly, just generally, on, on the overall earnings per share growth, it does look as though you're quite challenged in 24. Um, last year, you gave us uh, an expectation of about seven and a half billion, or more than seven and a half billion of earnings. You haven't given us a forecast for 24, and if there's a weakness in the plan, it would seem to me that you're starting from behind uh, the start line in, 20, uh, in 23, 4, 24, and you may struggle to get to the start line then. Thank you, Andrew, for your three questions. Um, the first one, it would be good, uh, a shared answer. Uh, Frederick, if you could start uh, around um, the claims ratio, bearing in mind, Andrew, that uh, we have yearly contracts, so uh, if you see a phenomenon, you always uh, have a certain time lag. And then, Patrick, uh, if you could maybe uh, talk about the German case uh, in detail, um, what it means of how to um, Im implement the improvement. Secondly, around uh, XL insurance and uh, the uh, financial line. Scott, if you can uh, give uh, a quick overview of where do we stand and uh, also show that this is uh, a uh, uh, live implementation of what is called cycle management. Uh, and then uh, thirdly, uh, Alban, if you could talk about um, the uh, forecast, I mean the 2024, because Andrew, we will not give a forecast uh, this year. We have only given a forecast last year because of the switch um, from IRS 4 to IRS 17. Um, but the question to give a flavor on the 2024. Yeah, Frederick? I, I start, so thank you, Andrew. First, you're, you're right on your assessment. So we, we had planned to have stable margins and you, you've seen that the combined ratio is increasing. The reason for this is that there has been a lot of instability following COVID. So as mentioned by Alban, we had planned well for inflation, which was not so easy. We had spikes in frequency in Germany and in UK retail and, 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 a, and a bit of Ireland for reasons which are not 100% clear yet. What makes us confident that uh, we will uh, uh, turn around these, these businesses? So Patrick has, has discussed already about the, the retail PNC. We'll discuss about the, 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 the UK PNC. We'll discuss about the German one. But we are clear on what we've done, including Germany on the 1st of January, what we've done on price increases, which has gone well. We are clear on what we are doing in the UK on price increases. So this is uh, the immediate impact. Then this is the opportunity for us also to review the way we, we manage claims, which, we, which is something that we, we have to do constantly. And we have projects ongoing. So my view is that we have a very high probability to achieve this turnaround in retail UK and retail Germany, knowing again that this is not a widespread phenomenon. This is a phenomenon which is focused on two countries, well identified, on portfolio that are well identified. So I wouldn't say this is easy, Patrick, but I would say this is not as, as if we had a crisis, an overall crisis on our retail PNC business. 
Thank you, Frederic, for uh, mentioning uh, <laughs> this, this is not easy. Uh, I have three out of the three, so I, I will tell you about Germany and, and the level of confidence, which is, uh, which is actually high. Uh, few things to, to, to highlight, first and foremost. I mean, the, the, the market probably will be in excess of 110 combined this year, and will do better than that. So again, this is a market phenomenon. And if you look at retail in Europe, to your question, I mean, this has been a fairly stable and profitable business and predictable business in the years. Again, what happened in Germany? Well, claims inflation, I talked to that, you know, it's about 7%. It was exacerbated in Germany because of supply chain issues, but we had anticipated for that. So Germany had increased their price 8% 8, 8 last year. Uh, what we had is a spike again in frequency and the frequency there is the post-COVID new normal, if you will. Plus, in that market, you got uh, uh, discontinued subsidies from the state to foster greater public transfer, tra transportation. That has exacerbated the, uh, the, the, the frequency issue. Uh, I would also highlight uh, a, a, an abnormal, if you look at the past year, level of, 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 of CapNAT. So there again, what gives us the comfort uh, we will recover the vast majority uh, of the profit this year. A is the strength and the boldness of the measure. Uh, we have increased double price, we, we have increased our price double digits. 75% of the book is renewed in Jan. So that's already, uh, uh, already in the book. Very much like what we're doing uh, in the UK, uh, we are reducing our uh, underwriting appetite in every channel in that market which is less profitable, namely direct uh, and, and brokers. It's about 10% of this uh, portfolio that we are uh, actually, uh, for which we're changing pricing and, uh, and, and appetite. And there again, um, we are extremely focused on claims. Uh, we're seeing orientation rate uh, picking up 10 points in the course of the last uh, six months. So our agents, our, our, our claims handler, everyone is incentivized and focused to drive orientation rate to the, the highest level. And I must highlight this, this is one of the trademark of, uh, of, of Germany. Germany is one of our platform where uh, technology, automation, and AI are, are very advanced. Uh, and we are, uh, we are using this uh, to fight very heavily leakage. Uh, we're seeing this uh, through claims cost analyzer, again, recover, predictive recovery tools and fraud. So, all of those metrics, I'm not going to get into all the details, but are moving in the right direction. The earned premium with the price increase I talked about, which are unprecedented, have been already passed. And uh, Germany has started to decrease their expense uh, last year. So we have tighter uh, expense management. As I said, it's a land of automation. Today, 70% uh, of the retail policy admin is in straight through processing. We're going to continue to scale that, and that's going to also obviously uh, drive uh, some benefits. So let's put things in context again. Uh, businesses that have delivered consistently uh, a shock in the market, we're doing better than the market from uh, the numbers we're having, and we're imp implementing, uh, I would say, unprecedented measures across all the levers to bring back this to the level where we were. And Andrew, before we go to Scott, um, Patrick is not alone in this game. He's being helped by Nancy, who is the group chief underwriting officer and who is the brain and motor, I would say, behind the successful re-underwriting of Excel Insurance and the successful re-underwriting of uh, AXA XL Re. So they are teaming up and working well on this uh, to make sure that we uh, keep our eyes on the ball. Scott, Financial Lines. Sure, I'll answer on the, with respect to the, the, the U.S. financial and specifically the, the public DNO book, uh, it's part of our cycle management. So in a few years ago when the market was very, very hard and the prices were up substantially, uh, you know, close to 100%, we obviously grew that portfolio significantly. We almost doubled it in that, in that time frame. And, you know, in the current pricing last year, we shrank it. We'll continue to, you know, if we can't get the pricing that we need, We'll continue to shrink it. We're not going to chase the volume at the sacrifice of margin. So, and to answer your question, you know, alt, it, it, in the aggregate, the book will get smaller, so the aggregate contribution to profit will be less, right? 
but from a technical margin standpoint, you know, we're going to continue to work all the levers on that attachment points, effective use of reinsurance, all that, to do our best to maintain that technical margin, and the size will be what the size is, right? So, um, we started, started on that on that discipline. It still remains a very profitable business for us, and we do expect over the plan that you know the de rate decreases that you're seeing last year and this year will stop and will start to normalize into some some sort of trend. It's just reacting to the big increases from years ago to find its more equilibrium in terms of of adequate pricing. So, thank you, Scott. Albon, uh, is 2024 challenge and are we behind the starting line? Yes or no? So, um, Andrew, I see that you have well in mind the uh, two headwinds that. Uh, I showed earlier, which are the, um, the unwind on the discount rate and the, tax, the positive tax one-offs that we had in 23 and that we don't have in 24. Now, against that, what do we have in 24? I mean, we have several elements. I think the first one is what uh, Patrick has just described for both the UK and Germany. And I don't want to uh, simplify uh, Patrick's job, but Germany is a cash machine and UK Health is a cash machine. We had accidents in 23. The, that that uh, will be repaired in 24, and we are very confident on that. UK Motor, we know, is challenging, but we are confident that we are taking the, the, the right measures. Just to give you another example on, on, on Germany, most of the retail motor business renews at 1.1. At 1.1, we increase prices by 18%. And so you know what the price increase was for the year, and with that, you are confident on the level of profitability that you will have for the, for the year. So the recovery of those three businesses is the first, the first item. Second, we shouldn't underestimate the impact of the earned rate of 23 into 24 in all our businesses. We had significant price increases last year, over lost trend, uh, in commercial lines in particular. And when I say commercial lines, it's obviously Excel, but it's also the, what we call the GI, which is half of our commercial line business. And we had very good volume and very good rate growth in 23. And we are starting um, 24 with a, also a very good momentum. Same on the employee benefit uh, and, and perhaps Patrick again, or uh, you could say a word or see on, on employee benefit generally, and uh, irrespective of, um, of UK, to show how we will increase margins. Do you want to do that? Well, I, well, I finish the list and then you. Uh, and then the, the fourth item is the fact that we had a low level of PYDs in 23 at 1.1 point. Um, and so, if need be, there is the possibility to, uh, to have a, a, a bit more PYDs. So that, that, those are the, uh, the four items which make us confident that we will be the, within the range of four to 6% growth of our underlying earnings in 24. Patrick, maybe to double up on uh, employee benefits? Yes, yeah, so on, uh, on uh, employee benefits, um, Reasons of improvement going forward. A, we're going to focus on those parts of the business where we get more margin, namely SME. Frédéric uh, talked about it. There's a huge opportunity. The demand in, is there. Uh, the dynamics we're seeing, especially in Europe, but also in emerging markets, uh, given the growing population, shows us that there is potential there to grow and to grow profitably. Typically, businesses that go through our tight agents with a strong tie with the SME owner uh, and we can command a, a far greater uh, premium. So that's on, on, on the growth front. And then on the, on the technical side, I think I talked to some of that in the UK. So first thing, we are making sure that every business along the lines of what Frédéric said around specialization has the ability to reprice far more quickly than what we used to do. So we're investing to get at the first early size the ability to price on a month by month basis across all our business. Second, um, we have some competitive advantage in that market. We're a leader in Europe in that market. We're a leader, uh, I would say, even globally on that market. 
and we have unique tools. Uh, this is a market where scale matters. So your data sets will make ultimately the difference. And given our position, uh, where we play across all customer segments, individual, large corporates, SME, and international private medical insurance, we've got large data sets and we've been able to actually build global pricing models. When we leverage those global pricing models and we implement it in countries um, like Italy, for instance, we are capable of driving double digit and bottom line growth. So we are gonna scale this. This is part of the scale up and EB is gonna be a, 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 a scale up play for, for AXA going forward. The second thing we have is we have through the InsureTech Frédéric talked about, EB Partner developed uh, tools that enable us to automate renewal at a level of granularity that we had never done before. So you go faster, you go far more segmented, far more precise, and the uh, impact on this, again, using some of the market, Japan, Mexico, Italy, and Spain growing top and bottom line in the last three years uh, 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 at double digits, so it's proven, proven assets. This enables fundamentally to drive greater retention and to push for price. Uh, all of this uh, are things that we're gonna scale up across all the, the entities of Axon. Let's go to the uh, next question. Uh, let's go to Will. Hi, um, thank you very much. William Hawkins from KBW. Three questions, if I may. Um, first of all, the uh, full year disclosure um, seems to show a significant fall in the legacy liabilities for Excel from um, 11.4 to 6.4 billion. Um, optically, that seems really helpfully to support your message about de-risking the business. But I wondered if you could just talk a little bit more about it. I, I'm not sure if that change includes an outsized benefit from introducing discounting that you weren't doing back in 2018. It may be that the reserves have gone down, but the sum insured hasn't moved so much just because of the payment pa pattern. So could you just talk a bit about the change in the legacy liabilities and should I be as excited as I am that they've gone down so much? Um, secondly, again, given it, it caught my effort when you were talking about the increase in physical distribution networks, <laughs> and you highlighted France and Japan. Um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about that. I mean, it, it's slightly counterintuitive in a tech-enabled world that you're adding more bodies rather than fewer. Um, and I wondered if you could just talk a little bit more about the nature of those bodies you'd be adding in terms of democracy and skill set and that kind of thing. Um, and, and then lastly, on the capital management, um, again, absolutely not criticizing the increase in the dividend, but I'm interested in your thought process about it. You know, given where your share price is, you could have thought that it would be a better trade to be doubling down on the share buyback rather than increasing the dividend. Um, an adjunct to that, given the stability in your business, did you have any discussion about introducing an interim dividend rather than leaving everything to the full year? Thank you. Thank you. So, um, Scott, if you could uh, talk about uh, the first uh, topic, and uh, the news is good news because um, it is due to claims paid, but Scott will go into detail. And then second question, uh, Guillaume Bory and George Stansfield, if you could uh, talk about uh, Guillaume for France and uh, George for Japan, what are your plans in uh, increasing the distribution networks and um, why are you doing this in a world that is getting more and more digital? And then thirdly on the capital management, uh, I'll take that question. Scott. Sure, I can start. Uh, as a reminder for everybody that what you're, the, sl the slide you're looking at or the information you're looking at is the 19 in prior years where at the, uh, a couple of years ago, we purchased the ADC. So a step back, you know, we, we had a lot of conversations around social inflation, what's happening on that. Our portfolio in the United States in particular is large accounts. So social inflation, i.e. the big verdicts, hit the largest companies first, because that's where the money is. So we saw this uh, phenomenon happening uh, really in 19 and 20, and we reacted to it both by I know, putting more money in, into reserves, but also the purchase of the ADC because our clients were hit earlier than, than others. The payment patterns that we have in this business, you know, it's a mix. It's some long tail casually, but there's also claims made in defense within uh, business, uh, occurrence triggers. So you get a bit of a mix. So really the portfolio of what you're seeing is the actual claims paid, being paid out. So over the last three years, a lot of the the medium length tails are getting settled. So. 
while the ADC remains untouched, remains un untouched so far. Yeah. Guillaume, AXA France distribution. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. So on the distribution within AXA France, what we see in the current market, at least in France, uh, but uh, I know with Patrick, we very much see the same trends in several of our European markets, is the fact that the, the winning position is really to combine the strengths of a very good physical distribution network with the power of technology. So we do use technology a lot in order to improve digital customer journeys and provide what we call this omnichannel experience. But if I want to be very concrete, in the end, insurance is still a product that you need to sell. And if you want to sell it properly in a world where you have more and more compliance requirements, and in a world where most of your customers are basically lost in front of all the changing risk, you do need to have, at some point, a human advice. This is exactly the strength of AXA France. And when you look at our performance in the past three to four years, we have progressively increased the size of our distribution network while increasing the investment in the technology to provide our distributors with tools that are increasing their productivity, their ability to understand much more quickly the customer needs, and therefore to provide them with the full range of insurance solutions. Because in the end, our value comes from the fact that we multi-equip customers and we are able to give them the full range of solutions. At AXA France, you can find an, an, an insurance product for any kind of risk. Second element there also that is critical is that the bulk of our value and of the value of our book in France is related to companies, either because we insure them, we are the insurer of one out of three companies in France, or because we insure the head of the company, who usually has strong need in terms of individual protection, individual health, and of course, management of his wealth or her wealth. On those elements also, Everything is related to the stickiness you have with your distributor. So that's the strategy. How do we execute it? We will further accelerate investment te uh, in technology, as mentioned by Frederick earlier, in particular in order to increase the average productivity of our distributors and slightly grow the number of tied agents. To give you uh, uh, an example, this year we increased the number of physical distributors in France by 3% and it's leading to concrete growth of, of the portfolio. So we need to combine both worlds. What we see on the market is that at this stage, you have a limited number of customers that are really ready to go for a full digital experience. Those customers are also customers of AXA because in France, we are the leading direct insurer with our franchise, Direct Assurance, who is today the number one digital player. So there you have a full digital experience, no physical distribution, and we have recorded a very strong growth in 23. We will continue to grow there, but even being the leader, we only have 2% market share with this digital player. So we see that the bulk of the market is still relying, relying sorry, a lot on physical distribution, and that's why we believe it's fair to heavily invest in them. George, on Japan. So in Japan, physical distribution is still fundamental. Uh, it, we have um, several channels. We've got somewhat of a unique distribution footprint. The main one is the CCIs, which was the traditional uh, channel of uh, Nippon Dentai, which we acquired 24 years ago in March of uh, 2000. Uh, we also have, uh, so there's 3,900 distributors in the CCIs. The advantage of the CCIs, this is quite unique. They're in every large and small town in, across Japan. They're tied in to, particularly to the smaller SMEs, um, and so this, this is quite a unique uh, footprint. In addition, since the acquisition of uh, Nippon Dentai, we've built two additional channels. One is financial advisors. There's 1,200 financial advisors, and the, the third is the broker channel. The, neither of those existed at the time. The broker channel, we've been highly successful in that. Uh, it's been built over the last, I would say, eight years. Uh, in 2018, to give you a sense of it, the CCIs distributed twice the brokers. 
Last year, the brokers distributed twice the CCIs. So now we're in a, a big focus. The broker has been highly effective. Um, we're now focusing a lot on the, on the physical distribution and the CCIs, and that's about lowering the average age of the distributors in the CCIs and changing some of the incentive structures, which in the past were very, very traditional, I would say. And we've gotten some, some good traction on this, but I suspect <coughs> physical distribution will remain important for the next many years in Japan. We do have a direct business. It's a direct PNC business that's fairly sophisticated. It's not so different <coughs> than France. Uh, the, the total market uh, of direct players in the, the motor business in Japan is still very small. Uh, we also had a direct life business, which didn't work, to be, and we've merged that in. There's some technology there that we'll use to di digitally enable the physical distribution, but the direct life business uh, never, never took off in Japan. Uh, we had it for uh, the past 10 years. Uh, we've merged it in uh, to, to, the, uh, to, to, to Oxa Life. So that's the uh, short story on Japan. William, on the last uh, question around uh, dividend, interim dividend, uh, what did we discuss? So we discussed uh, everything uh, with our board, but we uh, mostly listened to our shareholders, and particularly the uh, long-only uh, shareholders. And um, their request was clearly going mainly into what uh, is on the table today, to say, look, um, your business uh, is uh, much more stable now, your business is less volatile, is consistent, um, we would like to see a higher dividend, but we would also like to see an element of flexibility around the share buyback. And so what you see today is more or less um, what uh, yeah, uh, our, our shareholders and the long-only long shareholders wanted. And I think it's a good balance, and that was also the consensus in the boardroom, a good balance between a higher dividend reflecting that new business model, but keeping flexibility and at the same time being at a payout ratio of 75%, which is well in line with what our competitors are paying. We go to the other Will. Uh, well, this is Dom anyway. Um, so <laughs> uh, three questions if that's right. Oh, sorry, Dom. Uh, no, no, that's fine. Um, You're right. The, um, uh, so the thing that's a little bit novel in the plan is the guarantee of maturity business. Um, We've sort of all got used to the idea of, of general account savings sort of being out of fashion. Could you just give us a little bit of an insight into um, why you're now placing a bit more emphasis on that business line? Is it the rate environment? Is it solvency to reform? Is it just the technology you have available? Uh, what, what's going on? Um, and also, what's the economic profitability in that business? Um, I guess when you put in the asset management side of this, and you start thinking maybe solvency to reform allows for equity allocations and so on. Um, this could be quite interesting, so any insight you could give on that would be great. Um, second question, um, so the SCR growth, so Arvin, you, you made a point of emphasizing the four points headwind per year from SCR growth. I think that's about a billion euros, give or take, and this is going from a, an environment where you, were, you had no SCR growth. Um, I, I think you, in the past you talked about P&C growth driving a bit of SCR growth, but uh, life SCR running off and the net and the net being about zero. Um, it's quite a big step up in, in the SCR growth. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Um, organic growth, um, given your ROEs, is, is, is a great thing to do. Um, I just want, I'm wondering why, why such a large step up in SCR growth? And is that really, I mean, are, are you really giving yourself a bit, of, a bit of room or actually is it a substantial feature of the plan? Um, and then third, just detailed question. Um, there used to be a, an explicit policy of one to three billion whole co-cash. Um, I, I haven't seen it in the pack, but I'm wondering whether that's, um, whether we should sort of put that to one side now, given Arvind, you described four billion of, of cash at whole co sort of being stable as um, a rule of thumb. Thank you. Thank you, Dom, for the three questions. So um, on the guarantee at maturity, Frederick, uh, this uh, should be your question because you are the, a big advocate of that business. And uh, secondly, the SCR growth. Uh, Albon, if you could talk about it because um, growth needs investment and capital. And then thirdly, uh, Albon, if you could also talk about um, the 1.3 billion, uh, obviously, Dom, knowing that uh, the old holding company that used to be a pure holding company is now a reinsurance company. Frederick. Uh, 
So I'll start on the maturity guarantee product, then I'll give the, the word to Guillaume, because France is the biggest market for this, uh, for this product. But, so the history of life insurance in Europe is that you had two products, annual guarantee products, for four euro in French, but you had the, the same in other, in other markets, and unit linked. And over the past years, especially in France, but not only, regulators have uh, given space to maturity guarantee products where uh, the client has a guarantee on its capital at the end of the contract. By the way, it can be 100% or less than that. So we have some product at 100%, mostly in France. We have some product at 80% in Germany. But in between, you have no uh, surrender guarantee, if I may say. So this, this, this is a product we like very much. And if I look at the hierarchy, and we've discussed again with Thomas and the team recently of our products. If I look at uh, solvency requirement or cash or uh, CSM creation, the hierarchy is the same. So the best product is always unit linked. The second best product is always maturity guarantee product. And the third product is annual guarantee product. There's a bit of a tweak in Hong Kong, but I will not, I will not enter into, into specificities. So we, despite higher interest rates, we continue to promote unit in product and maturity guarantee products. And at the end, the clients who trust the brand, who trust AXA, we realize that they don't really care about the annual guarantee or the, or the maturity guarantee and they very much accept to have a maturity guarantee product. We even transform some existing annual guarantee products into maturity guarantee products. So what you could expect, and then I, I give the word to Guillaume, is that the, for us, the priorities remain the same despite higher interest rates. So everything we can on unit linked and maturity guarantee product. By the way, on maturity guarantee product, because it's, uh, we have a competitive advantage with asset managers. You could argue that in unit linked, we are in competition with asset managers. On maturity guarantee product, we give to the client something that the asset manager cannot give. Guillaume? So maybe first I will start by reiterating that for us, for AXA France, savings is a strategic market, clearly. And uh, in 2019, so a bit less than five years ago, we started this transformation, shifting this traditional capital heavy product into capital light, what we call Euro croissance. So we provide 100% guarantee after 10 years. And meanwhile, you have no guarantee uh, on your surrender. Uh, during the first two years, it was more a pilot. And in 21, we decided to offer the access to this product to our entire customer base. And today, what we see is that it's clearly the blockbuster of our growth in the savings market. What we need to keep in mind is that, at least in France, you only sell bundled products. So if you want to sell a unit link, you need to have an offer to couple it with something else. Today, more and more, we couple it only with Euro croissance. And when you look at our performance in 23, let's be clear, we are not overly happy with the growth in unit linked, but it was a difficult year in terms of market condition. But when you look at the bundle offer, Euro croissance plus unit linked, we grew it by 9%. So clearly, we have found now our customers on that offer, and we will further grow it. What kind of benefits do we expect from it? Good value proposition for the customer, and here, honestly, I can only repeat what, what Frederick just said. For the customer, all in all, for us, what we want to offer is a long-term saving solution. And we keep saying even publicly that if you're interested in a very short-term saving solution, you will not find it at AXA France. So customers, they want a long-term saving solution with us, even for retirement in many cases now. So Euro croissance is perfectly adapted to that, uh, to that need. Second element that we expect from it is that it's providing us with longer duration and higher margin. Therefore, you will expect to see increase in our CSM stock and progressively increase in our CSM release 
through this transformation. And I will conclude there. As Frédéric mentioned, it's both a move on the new business, and we accelerated in 23, and we will continue to do so. And it's also a move on the stock, where we are strongly advising customers to move from the traditional euro to the euro croissance offer. And in 23, it's a move that was really positive in the end, and that will help us generate higher earnings and also higher cash from our savings business going forward. Alban, SCR and cash. Yeah, and, and uh, it might well be that was, I was not clear earlier. The, it's a 2% and SCR growth, which translated to a four-point solvency uh, hit, if you see what I mean. So that, that 2% SCR growth should be compared to our 5 to 6% top-line growth. And, and in, uh, as such, it's not capital heavy. Does that answer your question? And, and on the um, hold for cash, uh, we have 4 billion. We remain at 4 billion, but we could uh, be a bit lower. That wouldn't be an issue. There's no specific target. In, in particular, we don't target to be at 4 billion. Are there any more questions uh, in the room? Hi, thanks very much, uh, Hadley Co. in Deutsche Bank. Um, Frederick, I just want to come back on one of your earlier answers um, when you were talking about the two-point margin improvement in P&C, um, 50 bips coming from expense ratio and half and half um, of the rest coming between the technical improvements and the improvements in UK and Germany. Um, if, I, if I look at the underlying, though, your, uh, there's another 50 bips coming from a higher cat load um, so I'm just wondering how easy it is to neutralize um, the higher cat load um, in pricing assumptions and what have you across Europe. Um, and what do you see the risk of political pressures um, and, and what have you in, in, in that respect? Um, and I guess, how do we get confidence that 50 bips is the right number and that number is not just going to carry on pushing higher? Um, and then I guess the counter question to all of that is if I take your new guidance, work that through um, and what have you um, and adjust for um, discount rate versus IFI and central like, an attempt to adjust the central cost allocation and what have you, your operating margins in PNC are significantly better than your multi-line appears. Um, and I'm just wondering how, at what point, how, how do you think about forsaking margin for volume growth? How, how, how do you think about that dynamic? At what point do you say margins are good? Let's focus um, on growth because it feels like you could potentially be a bit more ambitious on the, on the top line side of things. Thanks. Frédéric, the two questions are for you. Um, how uh, possible is the 2 or 2.5% uh, cash um, uh, combined ratio improvement if I add the net cat load in it? And then secondly, um, how would you balance the question around margin improvement versus growth? Are we aggressive enough on growth? Sure. Uh, thank you for the question. So first, I've not been clear enough on the fact that you're right, that we need to compensate for the 0.5 addition cat. So at the end, what to, to obtain the, my two points improvement, I need to have, I need to really improve it by 2.5, which, which is made of my 0.5. And as I've said, two points remaining, half and half. The point, and this is a very valid question, is how can we be sure that 4.5 is the right budget for CAT, knowing that uh, this year, Alban, if I'm correct, we've been at 4.8. So you could argue that it may not be suffi sufficient. The truth is we have no certainty. And we you remember that a few years ago we had a 3% CAD budget and we've moved to 4, we've moved to, to, to 4.5, despite the fact that we've decreased our market share because we've aggressively decreased our CAT exposure at AXA, at AXA XLV. So I do not exclude that we increase it again if, it, if, if, uh, if, if need be. My point is that we have to be extremely technical and price it well. And this is what we are doing with our internal model. This is what we are doing with our underwriting tool. 
at the end, cat is often hidden in other contracts. And we need to make sure that it is explicitly priced by underwriters and our price, pricing people. We are convinced and looking at the price today and the prices on property cat are okay today. I would not say they are great, but they are okay. We are absolutely convinced that if we are disciplined, we can, uh, we can make money on this kind of guarantees. Then your second question is also very valid because in insurance, it's hard to have high margins and increase margins and accelerate growth. And I'll start saying that when I discuss about accelerating from 2% to 5%, one part of it was just the fact that we will not have specific exceptional impact as we had over the past years. Another part of it are new initiatives to address <laughs> white spaces. In other words, nowhere we've asked uh, Patrick, uh, Guillaume, and Hassan to push the growth of their ex existing business. I know that if I push them to increase motor, then the motor business, it will have an impact on my margins. So this is not what we are doing. What we are doing is just stop what we've done over the past years because we don't need any more to do it. I mean, we've, we've exited the businesses that we wanted to exit and the white spaces on mean market, for instance, on uh, protecting the energy transition and, and and other, other white spaces that we have. Is it easy? No. But doing this, we think that we solve the trade-off. In other words, our core business is profitable. It, it will stay profitable. We just look at this uh, new white spaces that will bring 1% uh, additional growth. So it's, it's about 1 billion a year. We have to do it in a disciplined way. We are aware that when we launch a new business in a country, it starts with a higher combined ratio. And this, is, this, is, this is clear. But, uh, but again, no pressure from us and our business units to say, guys, you have to move to 2 to 5% on your business as usual. And Hadley, not, not all geographies uh, have the same growth. I mean, if you look, f I mean, Hassan was mentioned, maybe Hassan, you can quickly talk about um, where you uh, put your growth target, which is very different to, for example, what Guillaume and uh, Patrick have as growth. No, thank you, Thomas. Um, we have a number of international markets that, uh, where we are very selective on where we are. Um, as Thomas mentioned in the beginning, we are we have leading positions in those markets, and we have the ability to scale by leveraging all the capabilities of the group that Frederick mentioned in the introduction. So we finally found a very good balance after the transformation that was led by Thomas to be in the right markets and to know how to do it in a profitable way to grow and to give you obviously few numbers that you already know, I'm sure. We are, the markets that we are in will grow their GDP by tenfold. Their insurance market is growing by 15 folds in the coming 20 years, and we wanna be part of this. Our ambition is to grow beyond market growth. So you could imagine this give us a very high double digit growth in those markets. Last year, has proven that we're able to do it profitably. We've done it in all our markets profitably, and this is extremely good and gives us the ability to focus on unlocking the future as the name of our plan is when it comes to unlocking the potential of those markets. And as Frederick mentioned, this is part of the white spaces of how are we able to deliver organic growth in a profitable manner in those markets. I come from emerging markets myself. We understand those markets extremely well. We see huge needs driven by strong demographics, strong macroeconomics, and we are able to leverage it with the knowledge that Patrick and his team are giving us, for example, on health and employee benefits, where we're able to leverage those group assets and do it in a complement 
to the transformation that most of those economies are doing for their health systems. So we're able to really do it at scale today. Go ahead. To com a comment on, the, on these markets. First, because we never discuss them. And well, we have today. Yeah. <laughs> and we sometimes have questions from investors on, look, this is only 5% of your business. Why do you keep that? I, I start saying that this is 5% of our premium and 5% of our earnings, which means that these are profitable markets. We are usually top three, sometimes top five, in a limited number of markets. So I see this business as a portfolio of options. And I would say almost free option because I'm making money on, in these markets. Not all of them may be successful, but in the portfolio theory, I hope that uh, most of them will be. But I think that's interesting that you understand how we've discussed this with our board. And we've discussed this with our board in June. And we've made very basic projections on these markets. And we, we, we took a 2050 horizon because we believe that the responsibility of a management team is not only to deliver on a three years plan, but to deliver long term. And we've looked at population projections, GDP projections, insurance market projections, maybe slightly wrong, but overall true and overall, overall right. And we arrived at the projection that these markets that we have represent 5% of the EXA group today, and they will represent 35% of the EXA group in 2050. So, this is the responsibility of a good management team to have a long-term view. Again, we are not telling you we are going to be successful everywhere. Today, we are profitable in all our markets. They are well managed. We are amongst the market leaders. They are usually the tier two emerging markets, but, but, but huge markets. We are confident and we believe again that it's worth having these markets in our, in our portfolio. Thank you. Are there any last questions? The last question. David. Okay. Um, two questions left, please. The first one on, on casualty. So you've given some good uh, color on the, the reserves pre um, or covered by the ADC. Can you give us a little bit of, um, of details on what's happened since and our development of reserves from 20 and 20, 2021 vintages? Uh, and secondly, on Excel, so I, I believe you had a, a quota share reinsurance program that you increased last year. Uh, is that at the same level for 2024, and do you have any plans to change it? Thank you. Scott, if you could uh, take both of David question, David's questions, one on the question around uh, U.S. casualty reserve development, and the other one, what has happened to the quota share um, in 2024? Yeah, on the... Uh, for the U.S. casualty uh, portfolio or, or the casualty portfolio, um, the development, and we've been, we, we look at this all, all the time because obviously it's a significant one. It's actually been in line with our actuarial estimates, right? Right, Almost right from, because of that experience we had with the jump in social inflation, we've been, we've been pretty comfortable how it's been, been progressing. So both on the insurance and on the reinsurance side, we've been very careful of that. And part of that is also driven by starting in 20, we significantly reduced our, our net limits exposed, particularly in the U.S. casualty, where we, we over half reduced uh, our limits, right? We continued to buy, bought reinsurance on it and drove significant pricing increases. So all that is playing out as we thought it would when we originally, you know, obviously set the reserves and everything back in 2021. So uh, no adverse there for us. Um, in terms of the quota share, uh, um, sorry, which quarter share are you speaking of? On the, on sorry, on, on Excel on the reinsurance business, on the quarter share. Yeah, we continue to uh, maintain that quarter share, right? Um, you know, we uh, it varies depending on the on the on how it plays out. But generally speaking, we haven't significantly adjusted. We'll continue to play that obviously going forward in the plan. We have no. When we think about the plan going forward, we haven't significantly changed our view on the reinsurance. We will adjust the dials 
across all of that, depending on the terms and conditions. We can, we have the appetite, we could reduce some of it, uh, so we're not beholden to it, but we will we'll play that out as we, as we go across. Excellent, thank you very much. Thanks certainly in such a busy earning seasons to spend so much time with us for your questions. Thanks to my team for having answered all the questions and uh, we have spoken about many topics. We haven't spoken about technology and asset management, so if there's any questions left, you can also uh, ask them after the session. Have a great afternoon and evening and see you soon. Thank you.